<laughs> right, calling to order here. Um, lovely to see so many people here. Um, and there's some on my list that I got yesterday, it's in no particular order, who aren't here, so they might sneak in as time goes on. Um, just to take a couple of minutes, uh, thank you first to everyone um, who submitted poems to this anthology. You can rest assured that you went through a very rigorous editing process, to, uh, selection process to get in it. We had a lot of submissions and we spent hours and hours and hours sometimes arguing and sometimes mutually agreeing about the things to go in. And I think what we've got is a very lovely book and you've all got it and so on. Those of you who didn't submit things are just along here to to listen, thank you even more, um, because what is the point of doing these books if the only people that are going to read them are the people who are in them? So um, I, certainly there's been interest around um, the places where, um, where poetry happens. I mean, it's, it's hard to know how it sort of swims out into the wider world, but, um, but I think this is an anthology that will do well. Um, so thank you to Jamie for agreeing to the idea in the first place. If you want even more copies, there are of course them on sale afterwards, along with other things by Valley Press, who you ought to support. Nora Chastler's new book's brilliant. She's here in a couple of weeks. Come and see her if you can. Um, and so, without further ado, I'm going to surprise people in this sort of poetry bingo. <laughs> but I just asked who was coming. Um, can you just tell me your name? Oh, I'm also on the front here. Um, Oz Hardwick. Oh, yeah. um, this is Oz Hardwick, co-editor of the anthology. It is. But I'm not going to read mine. Um, I asked Jamie yesterday who's reading and he sent me a list and I've no idea why they're in this order but I'm sticking with it because it seems entirely random. It's um, the order they told me they we wanted to do it. Oh right, okay. <laughs> so the most keen first, and then the sort of I don't care about it. Um, so this is, uh, and I'd like to ask people to to keep to four minutes um, because there's 15 people about an hour. So so you're being terribly antisocial if you go over, and you might want to read your poem once forward, once backwards. You might want to read your poem something else. You might want to tell us about the poem. But whatever you do in the four minutes, you might want to dance, I don't know. But whatever you feel like doing, the four minutes are yours. After that, people will tut. And so, without further ado, Mr. Keane himself, the first person to say do it, Patrick. Right. Mary Bateman's Lament. Mary Bateman was known as the Yorkshire Witch when she was executed in York in 1809 for murder. But she had established herself as a bit of a con artist well before that, including a famous scam where she had a fortune telling chicken which excreted eggs on which were messages. That was rumbled when somebody who was disappointed with a message went back in to see her inserting an egg. Pepper chickens. <laughs> so this is Mary Bateman's Lament. It's in three parts. The first is the prophet hen, which is for scam. The sun will suck light from your eyes. The moon will hang bloody in your sky. Things slip backwards in these dark days. Naught is as it seems. And I, a simple farmer's daughter, am become midwife to doomsday. Look, my prophet hen spells it out clearly. Christ is coming. It's a providence. Each resurrected egg a testament to our undeniable fate. Pay me now. The end times are never late. <laughs> As I said, she was executed in York, but she actually lived in Leeds, in the Quarry Hill area of, of, of Leeds, so she was born in the North York Moors. And uh, she had a reputation as a healer, and she treated uh, a couple, Perigo, Mr and Mrs Perigo, over a series of years. 
And uh, unfortunately, she was well paid for it, but Rebecca Perigo uh, died uh, of mercury poisoning, as it turned out. She'd been dispensing a mercury-based uh, palliative to her. And she was uh, tried. The second section, the gates of mercy. <coughs> Gypsies skilled me in telling the future, but I did not foresee this fate for me. I fed to the poxy perigos white mercury salts in honeyed pudding for cure, not murder. All know me, a cunning woman, with recipes and remedies, potions against possession. It will not do. Famed throughout this town, yet twelve gawping men see only sorceress or slut. They huddle quick, bestow the gallows, the gates of mercy close, wreathed in shadows. Well, she was executed, as I said, in, in York. Uh, we know that she had a child, a daughter, but what happened to that daughter is unclear. But she did write a letter to a daughter the eve of her um, hanging. So the third section, Mary Bateman's Lament. Child, this day, as you sleep, I will hang. I pleaded my belly to escape the scaffold until a crone jury poked that to a lie. I am to die. There can be no charm in that. The ordinary prevails on me to confess that compassion not given here may be found beyond the grave. I will not trick any more. No poisoner, but a thief, whom no angel will save from the drop when I must dance as a demon. Remember me, daughter, a mere striving woman. No more poetry, but just a final bit. Her body was taken back to Leeds for an autopsy. We were interested in what made her what she was. And strips of her skin were sold as charms against all sorts of evil things. And the skeleton, until about three years ago, hung in the Thackeray Museum as an illustration. Thank you very much. One of the joys of these events is finding out whose, whose words belong to whom for people I've never met before. Uh, so, could we have Sarah Wallace next, please? Uh, after which, I'll just look, if I tell you the person that's coming next, it'll make it a lot of sense. After which, Michael Brown, please. Um, so this is uh, The Belly Men of Wakefield Town. I wrote this poem after I was sat on a bus, a um, double-decker bus, stopped at some traffic lights, looked down, we were into a building site, and there's these three men stood round a cement mixer, and they've got their bellies out like this, and the cement mixer's going around, the only thing doing any work, and uh, <laughs> it just looked like another belly. And uh, of course then the bus moves off, and it became this. So. Uh, Let's see how we'll go with this. The Belly Men of Wakefield Town. An empty mime of creation, they grow no flesh and bone. They stand and they scratch in the mud and gizzard. It's round and round, rose a pot bellied wizard. They could be giants in the mansion trades, building houses but for these beer belly masquerades. Raising buildings stick by stick, chanting. Roll this house brick on brick and make the cement stick fast and thick. Dust prime, they rip off their shirts and dance unafraid. Beer fed bellies out at last on parade. Pop bellies roiling, cement mixers toiling. On and on and past the hip flask. Primal dances from the past, chants from the shadows to set and cast. Grow this house brick on brick and make the cement stick. They suck their teeth and stomachs in, sinking ankle deep as the mud draws in. But the belly men, the belly men, they shake their bull necked heads and grin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, just going to read another one. Uh, 
Um, this is called Rescue. Uh, it's been published this year in Watermarks, which is for wild swimmers. It's for writing by Lido lovers and wild swimmers. I'm um, quite proud of this one. <laughs> Rescue. It brings elation, the skin seal covering of cold. But every swimmer in wild water deals with fear. It happened to me in Sweden, under the watchful eyes of an overprotective father, not mine. He saw the sink of confidence as the middle dark drew near. Deep lake water, bottle green, and hiding maybe monsters. Over halfway, the ripple stopped. Each stroke could pull you under, something unseen that shivered a signal and was glad to drag you down. Everybody on shore waved happily, but I was buoyed to see the father that wasn't my own climb heavily into a rowing boat. <laughs> so, is Michael Brown here? No. Sorry, Sarah Wallace. Sarah Wallace. Thank you. Um, and that was me trying to get people ready to know when they're coming off. <laughs> so now I'm just going to surprise Carol. Um, <laughs> after which, Wendy. But, um, yeah, so Carol Bromley. Stonegate Devil, which, uh, as I'm sure you know, is a printer's devil which is perched up on a ledge in Stonegate in York, round about opposite Betty, Little Betty's. Um, and the, the poem really is about all things that the Stonegate Devil must have seen in the 200 or so years he's been sitting there. The Stonegate Devil. He's seen it all. Mummers, buskers, guildsmen pulling carts with wobbling tableaus of flood, famine, crucifixion. A couple choosing a ring in Walker and Preston's, a man hurrying another man's wife down the alley to the old star inn, drunks vomiting in the snippleway, the purple cyclist on his purple bike going nowhere. The devil's crouched on that ledge since Coffee Yard was Langton Lane and Stonegate the street of the printers. He doesn't need the gear in old guy's rule, wears a black chain and a pair of horns, his skin boiled lobster. Those hands on his knees are man's hands, his feet the feet of a goat. And though you can see his ribs, he has no appetite for the eggs in Betty's display, the chocolate otter, the hare, or the candy daffodils. Does not thirst for the spirits in the window of evil eye, or the barrels of trembling madness, where the missing student on the poster, Megan, we would love to hear from you, smiles her pretty smile. Mm -hmm. yes. Sadly, as I'm sure you know, um, and also, sadly, if you name shops in a poem, they all go and shot on you. The purple cycles, cycles off somewhere. Um, I'm going to read you a poem from my um, new collection, which came out yesterday. It's a collection for children, and it's called Blast Off. And it happens to have a couple of poems which are um, about different places in Yorkshire. So I'll read you this one. It's called White Horse. I feel for the horse cut into the hill, he can't shake his head or twitch his tail. When somebody steps on that one huge eye, he can't blink them off like a bothersome fly. He never will kick up his heels and run, just lies there all day, come rain, come sun. His coat growing yellower, mangy with moss, the creamy white mane he never could toss, eroded by weather, by footsteps, by time. Once 33 men lugged six tons of lime and passed up buckets from hand to hand, creating the biggest horse in the land. By day you will see him from Leeds or York, that long white neck, those hooves of chalk. At night though, I think of him all alone, galloping, galloping under the moon. <laughs> I will read nothing into the way he looked my way when he said drugs or vomiting. <laughs> um, and so next we have Wendy Pratt, after which Ian. 
So, Wendy. Are you still helping? Uh, got my own theme tune. Um, these, um, well, the first poem I'm going to read is in the book. Thank you for inviting me to read. It's uh, lovely to be here in my hometown in Scarborough, and my poem is about Scarborough. And it's called In Scarborough. <laughs> <laughs> in Scarborough, there's a grey seal out at sea, a stack of dripping lobster pots, a whelk seller wearing a woolly hat, a nostalgia of postcards in a white wrap. In Scarborough, the view is inside out with cold. There is, in memory of, and who loved to sit here or came to Scarborough every year. There's a wind that whips grass on the headlands. Hats are lost here. In Scarborough, the word is funicular. There's a fuss and fluster as the season starts. We've been huddled as gulls while the north has been shut down. Now someone's fed the meter and we can all begin again. In Scarborough, there's a curve to the Bolly Bridge suicide rail, there to keep us safe from ourselves. We jump in Scarborough with the sea in our face. In Scarborough, there was a statue of Richard III, last king to reside in our seascape castle. There's an empty cage where we thought we'd kept our history safe. There's a space where he was, but he's been scrubbed off. Oh. <laughs> and this one um, is a part of I'm a PhD student at Hull, and it's all about the sea. My PhD is about the sea and how um, how a perspective of animals in the sea and around the sea changes depending on how we feel. Sort of, that's sort of what it's about. It's complicated. But this is, this is a poem about a seagull, <laughs> which is a common sight in Scarborough. So this is called Herring Gull. Let's go back. Let's pull back down Kate and Lowe Road, reversing at speed. Let's corner backward past the Lego brick school, the smug church, away the, from this smear of feathers and bones in the road. Let's rise. Let's fold the wheels beneath us, DeLorean style. Let's pick up speed over the new builds, over the campsites, the caravans, the grass-topped cliffs, the wind blowing the trees, sparrows zip-zipping back into their nests, back to here, Filey Bay. Let's look at this one instead, a herring gull standing in the small surf. Its reflection is broken by sand ripples. The dusk has made its back a saddle of ash. A wave is breaking over its feet. The gull lifts, splayed legs, uncertain wings, then skims along the waves, lifts higher, silhouettes itself against carnets, slices out to sea. Mm. Thank you very much. What really impressed me there was the way the first poem was accompanied by seagulls, and he did the seagull poem. It was silent. <laughs> I like to think they're all outside listening. <laughs> like the um, and so now we have Ian Harrow, after after which um, um, who I met this morning. Um. Uh, this is the poem about the York flood of two years ago. Um, I was in the York flood yesterday. I don't know. <laughs> April uh, deluge, moi. Um, but uh, it's called Newsworthy. A dumb tranquility spreads where yesterday the children chased their cries and shoppers on the concourse thumped shut car boots. Now, side by side, we look on, ourselves and the world at large, as the eventful happens here in our street. A vision of drowning signposts, rows of houses with the Buster Keaton stare, and what it must be like to be us. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of a continuation, it's a, a northern theme. Uh, this is a poem about going back to scenes of my childhood on Tyneside. It was in the 1950s and thoughts about that. De detour. I went back to be sure of my unrecognizable youth. A concrete square with no hedge where the poplar stood. A pound land in place of the surgery. 
doctors Dagger and Wolf. Somewhere else to feel we are not known. The names of the streets alone, Cookett Terrace, Rothbury, Simon Side, remained. The look of the streets had gone. Against the evening sky, the trees of Heaton Park were shaking black and soundless bells. We lived the summer days on bikes, and our nearest and dearest were a football and a toy revolver. Every year the bonfires blistered, stunted, back lane doors. We set the jumping jacks on the fearful and the old. Our snowballs secreted danger, stone fist in slushy glove. We watched for ages once before someone came to stop us tamping into a gap in the wall, a Catholic head. You could tell one by the shiny skin and higher than average swearing rate. <laughs> I still think the husband of the woman who kept the corner shop, Mr. Tulip, deliberately ran over my third-hand rally tourist. <laughs> and Mr. Valentine, working nights, running in pyjamas clean across the street, did we laugh him to an early death? Should we play the politician and apologise? If there were an afterlife, <coughs> they might be in jail for hate speech, or worse, condemned for eternity to blamelessness. Those slim-waisted women, the men in threadbare three-piece suits, and their children smiling at the sun on days when it was possible to be stylish, poor, and happy all at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Uh, next up, we've got Anne Cortwell, who some I do recognise, um, followed by Mike Farron, if Mike Farron's here. <laughs> so, Anne. Sorry, I just need a drink of water. I've done a challenge anarchist style run across the suicide bridge, <laughs> abandoned the car somewhere in Scarborough to get here. I do feel a little bit like this anthology's groupie <laughs> going around Yorkshire reading, but that's the joy of it, Jamie, so thank you. Thanks, Ros. Um, the poem that's included um, in the anthology from my own work is a prose poem set in the Valley of Nidderdale. Um, I went there on my own with the intention of writing um, and stayed in a second-hand caravan that belonged to a friend Quite frankly, it nearly freaked me out, but, <laughs> but I did do some writing. Nidderdale. Back home, Alice made a nest of coats in the caravan she'd borrowed from a friend. She was off grid. It rained all night, Nidderdale rain, heavy and persistent, drumming on the metal roof of her box-shaped room with the sound of the river like a bass note in the music of water. Her father, would have remarked, it's raining steroids, lass, or cats and dogs. She thought of Escher's stairways leading nowhere, the bourgeois print of a woman cradling an angry baby at the bottom of a flight of steps. At night, she dreamt of stray terriers falling in from the sky. <coughs> would she be furred in rather than snowed in? Limp, sodden bodies piled up against the cinder blocks of the caravan. Waking to sunshine was a relief. She parted the yellow beaded curtain and looked up at the gritstone moors, birch trees shimmering like unspoken words. Mm -hmm. And um, the second poem I'd like to read is from um, an anthology of mine which came out last year called Painting the Spiral Staircase. And it was inspired by listening to Daljit Nagra on the radio, mm -hmm. who gave a list of prompts. I think they're kind of roughly based on Hindu myths. And um, a writing workshop that I belong to in Hebden Bridge 
gathered these up and this poem came out of that. It's called Star Swallower. Every time she tried to speak, great beams of light came out. A beacon amongst women, her words cut through conversations like lasers in the night sky and people knelt before her to bask in all that iridescence. At night, her body glowed beneath her quilt like a fridge with the door ajar. She found it hard to close her eyes. She was a sunflower scattering seeds of light who longed for a starless sky, for power cuts, a coal shed, a cloak or wartime blackout. She put her fingers down her throat, but it was no use. The star was stuck like a wishbone, scraping the tissues of her windpipe. It burnt, leaving her thirsty for flagons of lemonade, for mint and honey. Doctors examined her, but she wrecked the equipment, short circuiting everything in sight. And the waiting crowds wanted her pearls of wisdom to bask in her language. She became a starlet of the tabloids, heaven sent, a new messiah who then, like a comet, disappeared from view. Some thought she ran away to Greenland, built an ice house where she sang to herself. Off the coastline, ships' crews marvelled at the new aurora borealis. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. For all the times I've seen the name, I feel I ought to know Mark Farrell. Um, ah, this is who you are. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so I give you back first with Mike Farrell, followed by Paul. about to leave school um, and go to university. It wasn't common to have a gap year, but the circumstances meant that I ended up having most of a gap year. But I didn't spend it on a, a beach in the Far East or anything. I spent it working in a place actually in Bradford, despite its place in this anthology, called the York Street Furniture. Um, Colin says he's got to have a break. He's gasping, and the box, the only place they let them smoke. He takes the player's pack out of the pocket of his long buff jacket. I don't. But then he doesn't even ask. We talk, but say nothing. The 50 quid a week is college beer money for me. For him, I have time to beer money perhaps. And when the tab's half done, the foreman slams him, takes one look, says, What the fuck? and kicks me out for wagging off when I don't smoke. I'm back to loading king-sized mattresses myself. I tried just one. Can't even span my arms across. So I just stand and sniff the reesty hot machine oil air, sweetened by seasoned timber as it turns to sawdust. Mm -hmm. That, that poem's done a lot of work for me. Um, I was very delighted when I got into this anthology. Um, I was uh, almost as delighted when Kim Moore used it on her blog a couple of weeks ago and it's in my, uh, my debut pamphlet which came out this year from Templar and there's a sort of a companion piece, uh, another sort of a um, poem of my younger days in Bradford but it's a family one, it's about my surname, Farron's not a very common surname but there are two possible explanations of it, there's an Anglo-Saxon and an Irish one and um, less romantically, the way the Anglo-Saxon kind of refer is called Fair Servant. My granddad knew intuitively what, decades later, the Reader's Digest's great encyclopedic dictionary proclaimed. We had two natures. In between the red faux leather, faux gilt boards in black and white, it told us we were Anglo-Saxon trash. Hines damned with a faint praise of fair, yet we were somehow also Irish, descended from Farrakhan, whoever he might be. And with that doubt he made the Land League Club his own, all pondered from which Catholic church he came to find his Sunday lunchtime pint, yes of course, just settled on the bar, and which old country town he called his home, and who he rooted for on finals day in the All-Ireland. 
how he kept at bay their questions, other than personal charm he never used at home, or tenor voice to sing, I'll take you home again, Kathleen, I never know. But in the shabby club he was no more a Saxon serving man, nor overlooker at Woolcombe's Mill, nor council tenant struggling for his rent, but a high king of Ireland in exile. <laughs> the words that I've read, so thank you everyone. Um, my poem that's in here is actually about the First World War. There's been a lot on recently on television, obviously celebrating, if you can call it that, the anniversaries, particularly Passion Girl. I've also been editing my uncle's Second World War RAF letters, so wartime imagery is very much with me at the moment. And this is Family Group at York Station. My jacket chafed, the collar too tight, buttons pulling across my chest. We stood stiffly, not yet parted, but no longer together. Better to leave now than wait, with Millie trying to be brave and not daring to speak, and her mother in her dourish chuckle face black, as if she were burying me already. The photographer, helped fill the space between farewell and whistle. We stood in line beside a stranger and his family. It was cheaper to share. I never saw him again. Maybe a bookcase in some northern town shares us still. Last picture before the whistle blew. Mm -hmm. Another place, I love Scarborough, another place that has a lot of meaning for me is Filey, where I've stayed a number of times. And this one was written after walking around on my own in Filey Churchyard. And this is Shadow Voices. Gulls straggle a copper sky, hawks bit and convolvers trap yellow sun. Beneath them, beyond plastic flowers and urns, the older headstones stand, blasted by an uneven wind and the salt spray of years. Some letters fade while others remain. Jacob of unknown surname lies there beside J. Hepwaite and unreadable, age 68. Below each posthumous claim, a faint and also haunts the wife. No eulogy for her, merely a name, and for favoured ones, two dates. Though outliving their men by twenty years, they are still, and also. On this burning July afternoon, it is hard to tell their forms, but they circle about and about each broken vault and tangled curb. Silently they watch. Women who could keep shop and home together, brew a fine beer or strain a cheese, gut fish and crack a crab as they chatted. Their laughter echoes in the gulls' cries. Their grief for fisher sons not returning sobs in the sea's ebb and flow. They haunt the afternoon, shadow voices, demanding memories requiem. Thank you very much, Pauline. And now, because I don't know, it's Jane Sharp um, <laughs> to be followed by Robert. I recently relocated to uh, Barnsley and after living in Crete for some 20 years so um, I haven't been on the poetry scene so I, I, when I did get back to England I started sending my work out and uh, I thank Oz and uh, 
I've forgotten Miles, <laughs> for choosing my poem uh, for the Yorkshire Anthology. Um, we like to, David and I, we like to tread the ground where we live and find out exactly where we are living. So we decided we would do the Barnsley Boundary Walk. Um, it's, it's quite a feat and it's about 6-10 miles every time you, you go out. This time was over Woodhead and if you've been up there it's a godforsaken blustery place <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Barnsley Boundary Walk over Woodhead. It's not a place for plimsolls or flip-flops, yet the red hyphenated line squiggling across the page makes it look an easy ramble along an ancient bridleway. Lang set to Dunford Bridge over a flat patchwork of moor, ignoring contours. It beckons a rucksack full of sandwiches, a hot flask, chocolate for emergencies, cargo pants stuffed with wet wipes, tissues, aspirins, and a pocket full of loose change for a pint of best bitter at the end. The reality is, I'm straggling a bog, a living colossus of roads, carefully moving clump to clump over <coughs> a peaty mire, like Rumble's ghost slogging home, my head ramming into the blustery northwest wind. There's a thrum of traffic in the distance, growling up Woodhead, masking my, masked by a howling gale force. My waterproof jacket inflates a hovercraft skirt, ready to move me over the tussock of tufted hair grass. And high in the sky, an eye, waiting, watches, waiting for boots to squelch into quagmire, for oozing mud to trap me in a fold of gallows moss. On the rise, a sharp shriek tugs me back, gets inside my ears, reins me in. I can see the chain on the page, meander past Wimbledon Reservoir. I can feel it bruise my ankles. The eye, still watching, waiting, pins me to a patch of purple heather. And in the distance, a sign points to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Thank you. I have quite a few um, unpublished poems, as you can imagine, <laughs> and um, and so I thought I'd like to read you this this one. I've been doing lots of serious stuff, you know, with with the uh, poetry societies and things, and so I thought a bit of light might be nice. The Rudiments of Musical Knowledge. If you're not into music, forgive me, you, there may be words you don't, you're not familiar with, but I think most of you will be. I was all a quaver as he waltzed me around. <laughs> then he changed the tempo and we tangled to the sound. It only took a minuet. His flat was very small and I bowed out Rallentando before the curtain call. <laughs> the phrase he used was simple, staccato, quite bass, and I gathered from the diatonic look upon his face that I'd better allegretto before he made me stay to repeat from the beginning in some other rhythmic way. <laughs> I coda stayed, I coda, but I dived off to the bar and composed myself a moment with an ice tonic sulfur. <laughs> Transposed, I felt much better, and called a metronome. But as I fumbled for my key, I heard his dulcet tone. He said, don't worry, I'll be brief. And then he paused to rest. He'd scaled the stairs in double time and had to beat his chest. <laughs> the moment was chromatic, but his timing was just right. And when he said, let's tie the dot, I had to play by sight. <laughs> My key became quite minor as we stood atop the stairs, and I accidentally dropped it. Not altogether fair, because he had to crotch it down. <laughs> and whilst on bended knee, I answered ad libitum, yes, in perfect harmony. The change in me was major. My signature became an ornamental sounding sharp, a quite augmented name. We learned the rudiments quite fast. Duets were slightly naughty. 
He trilled me then and trills me now, although he's well past 40. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to see the pages of the anthology come alive um, by meeting fellow poets. Uh, so it's great to be in Scarborough once again. I'm going to read two poems uh, who de which deal with time in, in, in a very different way. One's about the, almost the briefest time, a sort of glimpse, and the other tries to take in more, more time, considerably more time. So from the anthology, this is called Vision from a Moving Car. Near Friday Thorpe service station on the A166, young woman bent by the roadside over a pram, ground length hair on fire, sunset flaring through it, husband or boyfriend gazing away, smoking. <laughs> I've been writing uh, quite a bit over the past 18 months about rivers living in York, living with two of them, which occasionally come over their banks. And I've written a whole series, uh, looking forward to seeing them published in my next book, The Valley Press, in the spring. But this poem um, imagines almost a dialogue between the very old river and the people uh, who've uh, lived by the river for uh, many, many years. So it's called The River Spoke. Kneel in me, said River. Let my countless tongues lap you. Eber, Wista, Fleuve. Can't kneel, she said. My legs are too stiff from standing all day on the factory floor. Then lie in me, said River. I'll take you on a cruise of your dreams beneath the stars. Can't, he said. My aged mum, my noisy kids crave bread. I must work. Sleep then, forget. Here's a coin for your eyes, dropped in old days by a king in my darkness, plucked from the mud of the common wealth. We want to, but can't. Invaders are coming. Fire is falling. The zealots are calling. Our neighbors need us. Oh, come, spoke River. God's in his heaven. The walls are strong. The Lord's will provide. You've earned your rest. We won't, they said. Your words are a flood of lies. Though we've lost a lot, it's too late for quitting. Then stand, said River. I bless you. Take air. Gather. Build, resist, for as long as your flesh holds water. Thank you. For the last time I will look blankly in the room, I'm Evie Holder. Hello, <laughs> lovely to meet you. After whom, Pamina? Um, thanks again, Jane and Oz and Miles. Um, I'm particularly pleased about this poem because um, it's about my, inspired by my father-in-law, late father-in-law, Philip Boothroyd, whose son and niece from Germany are in the audience today. Um, well, the son isn't from Germany, he's my husband, he lives in Yorkshire with me. He was a uh, Royal Marine, he was a musician, um, and he was on the HMS Prince of Wales and it was sunk in the South China Sea in 1941. Um, the ship was sent into battle with the Japanese, being thought it was so marvellous it couldn't, and they couldn't possibly deal with it, and it was sunk with the loss of 300 lives on the same day as the repulse, I think. So that day, 800 lives were lost. Um, <clears throat> and he was from Brick House in West Yorkshire and end, ended up uh, having his, the rest of his musical career in London. 
So it's called Surviving the Prince of Wales, sunk 10th of September 1941, South China Sea. You walked for hours, freed from catgut and applause, week after week, miles from your London house, your cap slanted, scarf pulled tight, as if a young lad homing back from school on heathered fells, over the fields, through Calderdale, to mother, sisters, tea, the kitchen range, as if straight after practice, still loping to the wreck to catch the squeaky metal of the swings, or dizzy in the spin of solid wood that turned and thumped in any weather, conjuring a view beyond the grey stone town, across to Holmfirth, Saddleworth, or south to Engley Top, long before the M62 rose and dipped away further than imagining, somewhere further than imagining, before the crazy ack-ack and the roar, before the burning sea, mouthfuls of oil and screams of mates betrayed aboard that ship, as if long before you walked for hours, miles, metal sags tapped out the route between suburban garden fences and post-war semis. Your mind's eye roved over crags and streams to the wooded sheen of winter leaves and silvery bark, to shadows draped on dry stone walls and dales cresting blue into air, till your throat filled with chords that beat your heart afresh, sweet pipe smoke trailing a tale of home. Um, my pamphlet, Abolition Blues, and other poems, has in it a poem with a link to Scarborough. Jamie, you invited us to come today to um, spend a day at Scarbados. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't Barbados, this is Scarborough, Tobago. And uh, this is set in a swamp outside Scarborough, Tobago. And um, the U in it is us in Yorkshire on a little, uh, with a little group on a tour through this swamp. It's called Wetland at Petit Troup, which is the name of the swamp. Mm -hmm. Wetland at Petit Troup. After the boardwalk through protected swamp, look, wattled jacana, lily trotter, toes elongated, sprints over pads through pink and white buds and becomes its third name, Jesus Bird. In the grassy clearing, you gather along the curved edge of water and draw breath free from the press of damp heat. Back there, a yellow-crowned night heron stilled on a branch. A bronze lizard stalled its hunt for fiddler crab long enough for your clicks. Out here, you think you spot a moorhen in shade at the pond's far edge until the dull thing lifts. Purple gallinule, lit by Tobago sun, escaping on indigo wings. I almost got get up there, I was, I was just waiting. Um, and so, next we have Alina Aliyar, um, to be followed by Rob Myers. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Alina Aliyar. such an anthology. Um, so mine is about brim rocks, which um, I'm sure you, you, you all know about them, but they do look sculpted, you know, as if they've been done by Henry Moore or something like that, really artificially made. And in fact, that was one of the theories about them at one time. Um, and one of the things that strikes you when you go there is the, um, I suppose, the force of nature, that we live in a very human world, and we like that. But out there, if you imagine what it was like when the rocks were first created and since, um, there were trees that covered all the mountains. Humans were only one of the many, many interesting varied animals that, that inhabited the area. Um, and the same trees are still there, of course the rocks are still there. So this is Bruin Rocks. 
these big rocks, top heavy, once seemed sculpted by druids, and even now the devices of numinous floods. Deep lands sweep down like an intake of breath, and the sun licks around rock edges, striking life from the ragwork treasure trove. Trees always stood here, birch, alder, and oak, as they did over all of the hills. And here one day, a lynx chased a sunbeam, shaken around by the wind over last night's flint-struck ashes, and a buckskin hunter paused on a rock and watched. <laughs> Um, I was sort of hunting around for a, a kind of companion poem to that, um, and uh, there is one about Chauvet that I wrote uh, quite some time ago. The Chauvet Cade, cave paintings, from like, also from a very long time ago, and also with this overwhelming sense uh, of the natural world of the planet being um, at the foreground of things, um, rather than just one species of it. Um, and this is called uh, Chauvet. Space. Heavy as a snowdrift, cancelling sound. Close to, a screaming wind charges the earth like a big-shouldered bison, hunting its creatures, giving and taking away, fathoming disorderly trunks and leaves, splashed with pure dew, vivid with animal. Animal audio erupts with the odour of flowers. Inside the cave, fire lights up naked human feet, where bare feet to go by in parallel times. On scratches and bulges of rock, torchlight motion pictures flex. The artist shows how busy as yeast the pictures grow, ox and ass, mammoth, megaceros, and hermaphrodite room. And then, heavy as a snowdrift, the ages pile up silently. People sift. And the shoe of a Roman child seems stiff with the stuff of ancient time. Mm -hmm. And now, from the back, pass him over your heads, Rob Miles. <laughs> space, and now the glutted heavens are opening at the old mill. The hills get a piece of the sky's mind, where Rousseau's tiger leaps as if lashed, imagined beyond hock knees and pale lilies quivering in crazed vermin tops. Apparently cavernous, but the whole place seems to contract to the shrinking laps that separate strike from roar. Staff tug at giant blinds like riggers, and with each eye-splitting flash, families with their transfixed children become silhouetted, Victorian miniatures. We were only just wondering about the sound that must have once shuddered these rooms. We'd asked a woman at the till, who came from a line of mill workers, whose great-grandparents went completely deaf, both cloth-eared at the loom a world shrouded, where we sip our lattes and stare, not even lip-reading as they had learned, but silenced, except for the things only bones can share. Mm -hmm. Thanks, right, um, and to keep it, I'm very time conscious, um, to keep it brief, I'm very pleased to say that this piece of Yorkshire went around on a bus in Guernsey <laughs> uh, um, uh, after being selected in a competition. And um, it can be a lane from wherever uh, you are, but this, to, this was West Yorkshire for me just one night coming home. It's called Penultimus. 
The night bus ignites a tipsy kissing couple waiting at the stop after time. Acetylene in their crystal box. They don't part until the very last chance she has to step on, while he, all of twenty at most, watches with owl eyes, besotted. Melding with the glare of the bus, she's gone, but as it rises and it dips with the lane, he's left a spark, lit for a second with his phone. <laughs> Conscious Rob, then. Um, I, I too realised that I lived in Yorkshire longer than oh, Devon, where I grew up. Um, there's a lot of it back. Um, because of everyone apart from two keeping to the four minute thing, and only one of those nudging five minutes, if you'd gone any further, I would have thrown things. We, and also two people not turning up who are on the list, we are indeed early finishing. So thank you to everyone for keeping. To keeping to time. Thank you so much for so many people to come out and read your work. Um, you know, I've lived with these, Miles and I have lived with these for quite some time. It's lovely to hear the voice of the person who, who wrote them. Um, as we're early, I'm, I'm going to read something, but it's not, it's not mine, but it's a, the voice of someone who can't be here. Um, I got involved in the book a little after it started, so Miles did all the, the, the thinking at the start. Um, and got it sorted out with Jamie. And he, he approached some people, as well as putting out the general call to, to submit work. Um, I'm not quite sure how, um, who he got in touch with to get um, one of the late Pete Morgan's poems in here, but Pete's someone that I... I love his poetry, and so I'd just love to read, read his line from that. It's Brinks at Robin Hood's Bay, and I hope I do it moderate justice. Neat as a scythe, the rain has sliced the swathe of footpath from the cliff, discrediting the map. Five hundred feet below that blackness where the track goes over into air, the sea's tongue licks a thicket. From here there's only one direction pulls down through an agony of gulls. We lose a league of footpath every year. It clicks off from the cliff's rim, or it falls, and year by year the new rut where we cut our limit, inching closer to the hills, retreats no further from the sea. There's something here that sucks us to the brink, like salmon homing in on home, or moths round light, like the necessity to fight with no wars left, no common enemy our own small wars of petty bitterness. We test the strength of what we teeter on, the brink of England or a love grown cold in that familiarity of who did what, to whom, and why, and when. We go through this a hundred times, again. We need to know just where we stand, what odds are stacked against us by which gods, and what choice we have hidden up our sleeves. To go on, give up, or revenge the little wrongs that bubble with revenge. Fear is the truth of this last limit, where the track goes over into air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um,